Okay, welcome. Thank you for joining us for our program tonight, 13 Moons, A History of Wampanoag Culture. My name is Helen Liu and I'm the Programming and Partnerships Manager at Cary Library. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to thank the Cary Library Foundation, whose support enables us to bring programs like tonight's event to you. I also want to thank Pastor Brent for uh, connecting us with Darius and uh, making these programs possible. Um, I also want to thank Massachusetts libraries we, we partnered with to bring this program tonight uh, on Zoom. And those libraries include Ashland, Belmont, Tonesburg, Dedham, Medway, Stowe, Rowley, Somerville, Tewkesbury, and Watertown. Thank you all for joining us tonight. This program is being presented in person and via Zoom, as I mentioned. If you have any questions, please raise your hand if you're here in person with us. And if you're on Zoom, please submit your questions to the Q&A. And Darius would do his best to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. This program is being recorded and will be posted to the library's YouTube channel. I also want to mention that we have um, some other programs planned in October and November to celebrate Native American Heritage Month. Please check our website for more details um, at a later date. Now I'm so pleased to welcome our speaker today, Darius Coombs. Darius is a Mashpee Wampanoag tribal citizen and is the cultural outreach coordinator for the Mashpee Wampanoag Education Department. He was the former director of the Wampanoag Indigenous Program at the Plymouth Patuxent Museums for over 30 years. Over his career, Darius has worked with Smithsonian History Channel, National Geographic, and Scholastic, to name a few. His teaching of Wampanoag and other indigenous cultures in the history of the Northeast is recognized throughout the country. He has presented at conferences, colleges, historical societies, museums, indigenous institutes, and all grades and levels of learning in North America. Darius is also the recipient of the 2016 NEMA New England Museum Association Award for Excellence and the 2021 Bay State Legacy Award. Please join me in welcoming Darius Combs. Oh, who wrote that? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I won't thank you. Uh, Josh, thank you for everybody for being here tonight, virtually and here in person. I'd like to thank uh, McCary Library. And Helen and I have been speaking along with Pastor Brent for months trying to get these, this program going on this year. And uh, this is the first series right here. I was telling Helen that if we got to start it up, we got to start out with a little, about, a little bit about history. We'll get to the dancing and singing, but you need a foundation first, right? Um, as I almost said, I've been doing this for over 30 years, and I do a lot of direct services and indirect services. I left a well-known museum uh, a couple of years ago to work right by people. So literally right now, I'm three minutes away from home. I get to go home and feed my dogs, which is really cool. <laughs> <laughs> so I live right in Mashpee, uh, which is a big, large one in our community. But when I go into it, right, I want to go into the PowerPoint, what we have here, and uh, can we start it out? Well, I forgot to greet you guys. You guys having a good night so far? Wuniki Sakni Tapan. Wuniki Sakni Tapan, the keys. Good day, good afternoon. How are you today? You said you're doing well, right? That's a Wisi Darius Coombs. I'm glad you're here. In this presentation, as Helen was saying, if you can leave your, save your questions to the end, we'll leave about 10 to 15 minutes and we'll get to them. I hope you guys got seat belts on those seats right there because you're going to go for a roller coaster ride right now for the next 50 minutes. Okay, I'm going to bring your emotions up and down. And you're going to see me going up and down too. Because what we're going to do is I'm going to go start back thousands of years ago and what, how, how our life was normal. And eventually how our lives got interrupted and our culture got interrupted over those years. And I'll bring you up to present day today, what's going on amongst our people. But first, I want to bring you to what we call 13 moons. If you guys know what 13 moons is, that's a full year cycle for our people. It's about 12 months for a lot of people in the calendar. Um, we go by moon cycle. Um, you got the strawberry moon, you got the hunter's moon, you got the harvest moon, many moons throughout the years, throughout the year, I should say. And that's our cycle. And we've been living the same way. We're living the same way for thousands and thousands of years. And what normalcy was, you know. And like I said, we've been here for thousands of years. 
and myself being Mashby Wampanoag, Wampanoag people spread north of Boston, right? Going out towards central Massachusetts, right on Grafton, Worcester, um, going throughout Cape Cod and all throughout the islands. That's Wampanoag Nation, right? Amongst that nation, we have about, probably about 70 Wampanoag communities that made up over 100,000 people. I'll mention some of these communities, right? I'll mention Nantucket. I'll mention Pocasset. I'll mention Nauset. I'll mention Mashpee, Mashpee, Tropiquitic, Aquina, Seekonk. Some of these names sound familiar to you guys. They've taken on town names, but they've always been Wampanoag communities. Now, if you come to an area, what was known as Plymouth today back then, right? And you went up to somebody and said, hey, you, what are you? They wouldn't say Wampanoag, because Wampanoag being a nation of people, they would expect you to know that already. So they'll say from what Wampanoag speaking community they're from. So they'll say, oh, I'm a How about yourself? And Wampanoag communities will range anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand people. Each community would have their own leaders, where they had their own chiefs. The chief would have their own council. The council would make, and the chief would make best decisions to fit the community. And you see a lot of those communities together in the fall and winter. Um, for us as a people, you go all around the world, people celebrate New Year's, right? A lot of people celebrate it January 1st. We celebrate when everything comes to life. But think about that, when does everything come to life? When do the fish start running upstream? When do the birds start coming chirping? When do the flowers start coming out? That happens in the springtime. Everything's fresh again. So we thank Mother Earth. We thank the Creator for having another cycle because it's not always guaranteed. We drop our tobacco. We do our ceremony. You guys like to dance? You like to sing? We dance. We sing. We enjoy each other's company. We socialize. We eat a lot of good foods. <laughs> it's a, we're, we're not shy about celebrating, I'll tell you that. We're very, very sociable people still today. And that happens in the spring, right? But once it happens, once we thank Mother Earth, once we thank the Creator, we know we have to start getting to work and building our homes during the spring and summer. And how we live it during the spring and summer, I want to backtrack a little bit. I want, I want to bring you to a year, guys. I'll call it 1607. It's for the heck of it, right? This, this is still before a major interruption happened. And this is a house, what you see right here in our new year, what we live in during the spring and summer months. This is a cattail mat covered house. Cattail being a water plant. The cattails themselves, you harvest during July and August, you dry them out, you weave them and sew them into mats, and it lasts about three or four years. You see this round house, what you see here. This house would hold about six to eight people inside. And a lot of people say, oh, that's a lot of people being inside that house. You think of everything we do today, everything is done inside. People cook, people eat, people bathe, all of that's done outside. So this would hold maybe three or four generations. And that's how a lot of indigenous cultures still live today. They live with their parents, their grandparents, their uncles and the aunts. I know this, I live right in the community and I see this all the time still going on. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's your family, right? So you see houses like this going all up and down the rivers, right? If you guys ever been out, mid, out to the Midwest, right, you see fields, you see farmhouses, and that's how we kind of live during the spring and summer. You will see fields like you see here. You see cattail mat covered houses. You go up the river a little more, see another field and more cattail covered houses. Now, who takes care of the, the fields, right? A lot of people, oh, native people, they must eat a lot of fish and meat, which we do. But we also eat a lot of vegetables. I always ask the kid, you guys like vegetables? And I don't get a big reaction. <laughs> I'll tell them we have corn, we have beans. We have squash, we have watermelon, we have pumpkins, we have sunflowers, we have Jerusalem artichokes. And who takes care of these fields are the women. The women are considered to be the givers of life. They give life to Mother Earth. They also give life to babies. It just makes sense, right? That they take the life to the ground itself. 
Now, when do you plant corn? You can't say every May 15th, we're gonna plant corn. You have to wait until different signs of nature happen. You have to wait until the shag bush start to bloom. You have to wait until the oak leaf is as big as a squirrel's ear. You have to wait until the herring start to run. And when you see these signs of nature happening, you have to wait until the next new moon. The reason new moon is when you plant the corn, the new moon draws gravity up. So it helps the corn seed grow. And when a corn gets about hand high, you plant the beans right next to it, and the beans will wrap right around the stalk of the corn, right? Corn takes nitrogen out of the ground, beans adds it right back into the ground. Plant your squash, your watermelon, you like squash? Watermelon, pumpkin, sunflowers, not on the bottom. So sunflowers on elsewhere. So the plants with large, large leaves you plant on the bottom, and they will shade the ground and keep the ground soft. A planting site for our family will probably be about two acres in size, and probably over 60% of what you ate for Wampanoag people to, for the diet you had vegetables, 60%. You had throughout the year. Now, how did you have vegetables during the winter? You dry them up. After harvest time, you dry them out and put them in bags and baskets and bring them back with you to your winter community. So a lot of planting, right? Also, and that's what the woman's responsibility was mainly during the spring and summer, was taking care of those fields. What we would also have, you guys might have seen this before, is we would have a structure in the middle of the planting field, what we call a corn watch tower. And that's when you see young girls and you would have young girls up there making noises, trying to scare away the birds from eating the crop. So we look at it as more or less like a human scarecrow. Back then, the flocks of blackbirds would be so large, they'll come in, totally cover the sky, and go after the seed. So it would be a young girl's responsibility to help keep them out. So women planting during the summer, spring and summer months. What do these guys do? And they're not my real daughters, I don't do much of anything. <laughs> no, these are my real daughters right here, and they're really good kids. Um, this is Tashima and Storm. Kids can do whatever they want to do. Kids are encouraged to play a lot. You like to play? You guys like to swim, you kids. Do you like to dance? Do you like to sing? Yeah, you like to pick berries. You like to have running races. That's what kids do. Right? Until you get older. Now, older is not a number factor. We don't go by one, two, three, four, five years old. We go more, more or less by maturity levels. Each person grows up differently, right? You, some people might know some people who are 10 years old who act a little older, maybe act a little younger. That's how you judge a person. And that's when you name the change, depending on how that person is. Okay? Now, these, like, these are my real daughters. The one picking the berry, the staghorn sumac, which is good for making tea, high in vitamin C, three times as much as orange juice. Her name is Tashima. And what Tashima means in Wampanoag is one who lifts up. That's not because she's big and strong, but Tashima wakes up in a good mood almost every single day. And when she wakes up in a good mood, everybody feels good, right? Almost every single day. <laughs> 95%. My little one right there, Storm. Um, she's a storm, yeah. <laughs> I got four daughters, so those are my youngest right there. But kids were allowed to be kids until they got older, you know? They knew their roles. They listened to the elders. They listened to the ones who've been there, done that. Okay, and that's our grandparents, the great grandparents, which we have much respect for. This is me, my lovely wife, Tootie. She teaches language, guys. We'll talk about language in a few. But the men did a lot of the fishing, guys. The men are considered to be the altars of life. We take life, you know, when it came to fish, but we have respect for life. You do ceremony behind the fish, behind the animal, behind the tree you're taking, okay? Um, you might see the woman do a little bit of shell fishing. You think of fishing, everything we have today for fishing, we had back then. We had harpoon, we had hook and line, we had nets. We had spears. We had, um, you guys like lobster? Yeah, you like lobster. Yes. We had so much lobster that we were going to beach at low tide and pick lobster right off the beach. Pick it right off the beach. It was considered to be fishing bait. You go back 100 years ago in Massachusetts, right? 
Lao Tzu was fed to prisoners almost every single day. And the prisoners had a big uprising and said, hey, come on, we don't want no more. And there's a law that was put on the books that you only could feed Lao Tzu to prisoners twice a week. If you did it anymore than that, it's considered to be inhumane. Right? Times change. But even like in 1623, right? The Pilgrim's governor, Governor Bradford, right? Had this big ship come in, big boat. And you see, he was so embarrassed. He goes, that's why I have to feed you guys as lobster. I'm sorry. Not a big deal. We ate it. It was nothing special. The types of fish we would go for, cod fish. They say there was so much cod, you could walk right across the backs of Provincetown. We had flounder, walk down the beach at low tide, spare flounder. Clams, mussels, crabs, um, bluefish, you name it. It was plentiful back then. There's two terms that have been stuck on indigenous people, right? Um, well, war like in survival. Survival, you just don't wake up in the morning, hey, geez, what do I do today? There's a system set up for thousands of years that people knew what to do, okay? Like there's plenty of food out there, plenty of natural resources. The largest fish we would go for, the men would, was found in rivers and found in the ocean. They go back and forth. Any idea? Sturgeon, guys. Sturgeon grow 20, 30, 40 foot in length around here at one time. And they've been fished out of the waters because a lot of people like their eggs, what they call caviar. So we had our machine ashes. If you guys own machine is, that's a boat. We have our dugout canoes, right? Our dugout boats range in sizes anywhere from a one-man boat to boats big enough to carry over 40 men. We have three different recordings of Europeans seeing 40 man boats being 60 foot long, six foot wide, being sailed out the Nantucket Island. Not paddled, but sailed. And that's how you got around. You either walked, you ran, you ran or you use your boats. Then you get a lot of folks say, hey, what, what about the horses? Horses were not seen around here not until the 1640s or 50s. They were actually seen around this area first, what was known as Boston. Um, Mass Bay back then. But before that, you ran or you used your boat or walked. Now, after um, the fishing and planting season, after harvest, you get your harvest out, you move inland to a winter community. And that's when you move in your Patuxets, your mash bees, your quinners. And also, what you see there is an elder, Dave King, good friend of mine. Unfortunately, he's passed. He's from Aquasazi. Up in, he's from up in New York, Onoshone Nation. Um, he's an elder, he was an elder. He taught us a lot. And like I said, you gotta respect your elders. They've been there, done that. And that's what the teeth, that's what the kids listen to. They listen to those stories and still today. We have our clan mothers, right? Who pass down these stories. You have our elder men who pass down these stories, which is very, very special. You cannot respect, you, you have to, have to respect the elders. You have to respect life period. And what you see there, that is our winter house we would live in. That's a bark covered house. And types of bark covered houses we would have, we would have um, elm and chestnut bark. That's a very small one, that's 20 foot long, right? We had houses that would be 100, 200 foot in length, 60 foot in width. The largest footprint that was found, that we found of a house was found right around the border of the Nipmunks near Grafton, right? This house was 320 foot in length and over 60 foot in width, the footprint. In my opinion, it was more than that, just a house and it was more um, a gathering a nation type of house, a meeting quarters. But each, each house during the winter would hold 10, 20 families on the inside. So you live, so you live in large communities, right? During the winter, you hunted. The four big animals we would hunt for, we'd hunt for deer, black bear, Moose, elk, the common bird would have been turkey and goose. How we hunted back then would have been bow and arrow, most common. You can actually use different deer, like a snare, which is like a trap. A young sapling bent over with a trigger system hooked up, right? And the animal, if you had a big one, the deer would come along, step on that trigger and be launched up in the air. <laughs> I tell the story all the time, it's funny, I like it. Back when the Pilgrim first landed, right? They landed on Cape Cod. They have scouting out the area for drinking water. And their future governor would be William Bradford. He wasn't governor then. He was walking through the woods and he's, that's what he stepped on. 
<laughs> yeah, he did. He stepped on the desk and then he got launched up in the air. Now, when I worked at Plymouth, right, they are acting up there. They're playing characters. So I've got good friends of mine up there. And I'll send all the visitors up there. Go ask, go see how the SIP's doing today. The governor, let's see how the governor SIP's doing. Because the rest of his life, he complained how, how swore SIP was. So yeah, he was all right. He lived a long life. But yeah, hunting was very big. We only hunt animals that ate berries and greens. We knew the meat was the best. We knew the hunt only during the fall and winter and still do today. Because that's when the furs are the best. And that's when they're not carrying that young. And that's very important. Weaving, very important still today. This is one thing that has not been interrupted. It's one thing that we still have going on today. Women, our Wampanoag women are well-known weavers. Their weaving is in the National Museum of the American Indian at Smithsonian down in Washington, D.C. Um, you don't believe how many people I tell you, they ask me, did you guys have string? <laughs> so yeah, we had string. We had string from maybe different types of plant fibers, right? Milkweed, dog bean, the inner bark of a basswood tree. You take those fibers out and you work them together on your leg. When the colonists got here, they said, the Wampanoag woman was making strength so fast that their eyes couldn't even keep up with it. And you dye it with different types of berries and roots. That's a very small bag, what you see there. We have large bushel bags, in which we store our dried vegetables in. That's three of my daughters. That's my oldest. And that shows you what an inside of a house would look like, especially bark winter style houses. You see a clay pot. You see them drinking their tea. This is, comes from a very famous video, guys, for you kids. If you haven't seen this, it's called The Wampanoag Way. Have you seen it? We worked with Scholastic about six, seven years ago and produced a, kid, a video about how kids lived back then. And that's what they wanted. Scholastic said, well, we want to know how Wampanoag children and family lived back in the 17th century and before. I told them directly, I go, we've done that. We've done that before. I go, why not we show them how they lived back then, but what they're doing today. And if you see that video, you see Tashman and Storm, I am riding their bikes, the little scooters, they're playing on a swing set. They're doing what kids do today. And they're still whomping on, right? Doesn't matter what you wear, what kind of bike you ride, the couch is still thriving. They're proud of it to that video. They said, Dad, I got over a million hits already. Like, <laughs> I don't know what that means, but. <laughs> okay. That in a nutshell is, I can always say a little lot deeper, but that's how we lived. We come spring again, new year, we come out near the ocean. Enough so every year that the land will take care of you. Once you start to see the planting not coming up as well, you move on. For a winter community, once you start to see the animals not coming around for hunting, you move on, winter might be 20 years. A plant to say might be five or six years. Move on is next door. Move on for winter community might be a few miles away. So like I said, describe what Wampanoag Nation is in that area local, right? That was normal, right? That was normal. So right now I'm gonna get your seatbelts on, right? I'm gonna bring you to a year from 07 to 16, 14. I want you guys to remember the dates. I'm going to throw a lot at you right now. Back in 16, 14, you guys heard of John Smith, right? You might have heard John Smith. He mapped out New England. When he left, he left his fishing captain behind to do some more work. And now his name was Thomas Hunt. And what Thomas Hunt did, he landed down in what is known as Plymouth today, what we call Patuxet and took 19 Patuxeta slaves, okay? And Squanto was one of them, Squanto. He went down Cape Cod and took eight Nauset Wampanoag as slaves. Remember that, eight Nauset, because that comes into play a little bit later. Eight Nauset were taken as slaves. They were brought over to Spain, a lot were sold, and the remainder were sold to England, okay? And we know Squanto was sold to a merchant named John Slaney, lived on a place called Corn Hill in London. He was an exotic specimen. Um, they pranced him around. And for one, endangered servitude, that's what, that's what he was doing. But what I hear, and I haven't had anybody, any English scholar can give me an answer for this. They said he gained kind of some kind of um, 
statue over England. For a native person to be in statue over London or England during that time, I had no idea what that means. What I do know is the idea for us being brought over was to teach us how to um, teach a language and hopefully bring us back as guides and interpreters. I can tell you in the most part, once we got there, we died because we had no built up immunity to what other people had. Something that was small for some cultures of people was huge to others. So you see people dying off in the, within days. There's a few stories of people coming back, which I'll touch on that. Squano did make it back. I'll go back to him in a minute. And that was in 1614, remember that date. He was over London. <clears throat> That's Squanto right there. Now this right here is the most devastating thing that ever happened to our people, period, right? Plague happened around this area. There's a major plague that happened between 1660 and 1619. And those are important dates because this is the year before the pilgrims arrived here, right? What we know about the plague, it starts in Northern Maine. It goes along the coastline, goes 30, 40 miles inland. It wipes out whole nations of people and it stops dead in its tracks before the Narragansett people down in Rhode Island start. start. So hit, hit Wampanoag people, there's a guesstimate anywhere from 70 to 90% of our population was wiped out. So you're looking at back then, over 100,000, a good guesstimate before plague hit. Today, 2022, 15, 20,000 remaining. Why would it stop? Why not go to the coastline? Why not go to Florida? If it's not to know the main, what would stop that? Ran out of coast. What was that? We ran out of coast. Yeah. yeah, kind of. We have two different answers, I, at least I do, the possibilities. There's one down there, you got the Narragansett people. And we know families, could have been more of the families between the Wampanoag and Narragansett did not get along during that time. And I'm not saying it happened all the time, but during that time, there's feuding going on. And if you don't like a group of people, you don't have that physical presence with, with each other. And for diseases spread, you have to have that physical contact. We know Nantucket, the Vineyard, Penakees Island, Cuddy Hunk, all the islands off Cape Cod weren't really affected by that plague because they were out in the ocean, at least not in large numbers. What was it? I always tell folks that it doesn't matter to me. You can put it as any name you want on it. Over the years, they say smallpox. We know, we know smallpox happened in 1623. We know there's a huge outbreak in 1633. Over the years, common interpretation was hepatitis, because they say the skin turned yellow and people got open sores and they died within days. What I can tell you also is disease control came out something over 10 years ago. They believe leptospirosis. And what that is from the French trade ships up north, they would have rats on the trade ships and the rats would come off and the fetus of the rats would get into the water, creating an infectious liver disease. So that's the latest. We just call it yellow fever for our people. That was devastating. Can you imagine? I can't still. I've been doing this for years. The people we lost, the leaders we lost, the medicine people. I still, what we are as researchers, you got this big puzzle and you try to fit it together the best you can. But I get upset a lot, a lot of times because I don't fully understand how everything was set up. A lot of good guesses, but in my opinion, fully understand it, you have to go back before play hit. Okay, we um, pick up a little speed here. Everybody knows what this is, right? The Mayflower. They just had the 400th year, 400th of the anniversary 2020 go on. You know, um, 400 years compared to easily over 12,000 years for our people. It's not really a big number, you know. But they came over. The colonists in 1620, and they first landed on Cape Cod. They landed on Provincetown, scattered around through East Ham, Nauset. And during that time, when they're looking for a place to live, they found a lot of indigenous Wampanoag burials, which were turned over. There was one party of people who took from the graves, another party of men who did not. It doesn't matter to me who, which ones it was. It, the graves were disturbed, and you just don't do that, right? We also know there was a lot of corn taken. 
I, if I was traveling across the ocean all that month and I needed food, I might have taken the phone too. I don't think that's really that big of a deal. But later on, they got repaid. But what happens, right? They go down to East Ham and there was an indigenous and whopping out people down there and the leader of that community was Aspinet. And that's when first the counter broke out a fight between the two people. There was musket ball shut off. There was arrow shut off. Why that happened? Why did that happen? Burials turned over, taken from, taken over corn. Do you remember what Thomas Hunt did? 1614? That's where he took those people from. It was eight Nauset. I'm sure Aspen was probably thinking, hmm, another ship? Guess what? You're not going to take any more of my people. So you got to go. And when they got forced out, they landed down what is what is what we call Plymouth today. And they were fortunate enough to land where they did because um, those, that area was, died off from disease. If they landed four or five years before, it wouldn't have been anywhere around there. That first year when they landed in December, 1620, half died. The February was the deadliest month for the colonists. They saw, they, they saw the three or four sightings of native people. There's an island off Plymouth called Clark's Island. They saw native people at. They saw they saw Wampanoag people going through the woods with their dogs. Another sighting is in February. Say they said they saw Wampanoag man, one man on top of the hill, and the man was waving over to him, and they were waving back, and they either one either one didn't come toward each other. But what they did hear, they heard a lot of Wampanoag voices down the hill, so he wasn't by himself. So what happens, right? March of 1621, this guy comes into the village, right? Into to the Pilgrim Village, his name was Samuset. Now I'm gonna flash back a little bit. I'm gonna flash back to England in 1619. This is in 1621. 1619, there's a man named Fernando Gorges who's funding all these trips over here, right? And they're asking, well, what native people person do we have? Do we have? It's from there. So I want to bring him back over to the scout. They go, well, Squanto is. But Squanto's up in Newfoundland with Captain Mason as a guide. Well, go pick them up, Thomas Dermer, go get them and do a trip down the coast and find out what's going on. You know, I want to do another scouting trip. And this is in 1619, right? So Dermer picks them up in Newfoundland, brings Squanto down the coast. You guys remember the dates? 1619 plague was just getting over. Imagine what Squanto was thinking. He came to his homeland of Patuxent. All his people were wiped out, at least most were. So he was a changed person, right? When he, before he got to Patuxent, they stopped in Mohegan Island in Maine and picked up a Sagamore named Samuset, a leader. We don't know if, if Samuset went on voluntarily on Dermot's ship or if he was taken. But they go by Patuxent, Plymouth, and they end up going to Martha's Vineyard, what we call Capilac. I'm gonna to talk to you another day, right? The leader of that community, Epinal, was taken as a slave over to England in 1611, right? Epinal was a smart, smart man. Gorgeous, same guy in 1613 said, Gorgeous goes to Epinal, do you guys have gold over there? He goes, yeah. You bring me back home, I'll show you where the gold's at. 1613, they bring Epinal back home. He yells out something in the native tongue which English did not understand. Men come run to the beach and bombard the ship arrows. Epino and others had a jump, chance to jump over, over and swim the shore. That's a good story about us coming back home. Fast forward six years, 1619, Durham is coming <laughs> into, into the Bay of, of Cap Whack. And Epino is thinking, oh, geez, not again. Attacks the ship, Durham gets injured. Squanto and Sam said had a chance to jump over, swim the shore. And it gets a little gray in there, right? We think Squanto and Sam and Sam went to go live in Massasoit's community, Poconoke, which is in Bristol, Rhode Island in 1619. And Massasoit heard about these people landing. Say, so think about these people, right? The colonists, we were used to people coming over, right? We weren't used to people coming over and staying. They, would let, they left, the men left. And those people who were here prior, those Dutch, those English, those French, the traders, that's the thing you term you hear a lot as traders and fishermen. If you're gonna use that term, you have to add on enslavers, all in one breath. 
you got to say fishermen, traders, and enslavers. This is what they wrote down. This was considered to be normal for them. But when the colonists landed here, they brought women and children, and they stayed. So Maso is probably thinking, what's going on with these people? They should have left already. But they have women and children. I see a lot of them dying. Samus said, come here. I know you're not one of my people, but you can speak English, right? Why don't you go into the Pilgrim Village and see what's going on? Samus said, does. He greets them by saying hello in their own language. He actually sleeps in, Sam, in Stephen Hopkins' house that night. <laughs> I found that unusual myself. Why do you think Stephen Hopkins? We think because he was the first, we know he was the first only pilgrim that dealt with Native people before down in Jamestown back in 07. So he might've they might have thought Stephen Hopkins would be more comfortable with him. Sam as runs back, he said, he says, you know what? I'm not from here. I'm gonna bring you who leader who is. And he brings back Master Soyet and makes that very famous treaty between the two people that lasts over 50 years. And so many wars where the states, if you go to war, I'm gonna help you out. I go to war, you help me out. Aside from that, we keep separate lives. One thing I want you to remember, Wampanoag Nation is big. It still had good numbers after plague hit even. That treaty was made with Plymouth Colony in Poconoke. And Poconoke was 40 miles west of Plymouth. It was considered to be a two days walk, okay? You hear about Masai, oh, the Masai, the great Wampanoag leader. Sure, he might've been a great leader. That's who they dealt with, right? That's what the English dealt with, dealt with and that's who they wrote a lot about. With, about. So there's no sign of him governing other people. We know he had influence though. Thanksgiving, you guys heard of this? <laughs> this happens in 1621, what they call Thanksgiving back then was a harvest festival. They just made the treaty with the English, with, with the Poconokets. And they say in late September, early October, not in November, they say Massasoit comes with 90 of his men and makes a very famous, um, has, and has a three-day dinner with the English. They dance, they sing. Uh, in my opinion, a form, one of the first forms of diplomacy you would have seen back then between the two people, okay? It goes on for three days. And actually, Matt Sawyer sends his men on hunting. They say he comes back with five beer. If you're a hunter, right, you know you have to process a deer. You have to bleed the deer. This is also my opinion, too. I think he had these deer all set up already outside the community, right? <laughs> they just weren't just killed. <laughs> these were ready to eat, you know? Brought him in, here you go, Governor Bradford. I know I brought a lot of men, yeah, 90 men, so. Yeah, and that happened only one year. If it wasn't because of this guy, history would have been different today. This was Massasoit's right-hand man, Habermas. Like I said, Massasoit's community is 40 miles west. Habermas was considered to be a penis. If you don't know what a penis is, that's one who, who counsels on war and one who leads in the battle, and they are raised from little ones. You see the qualities in this person, right, this child? And from then on, that person be raised spiritually and physically as a panisse. One of the final stages would be a panisse. You'd be given a stone knife and you expect to go to the woods alone for a whole winter. If you came back, you'd be a panisse. If you didn't come back, you wouldn't, right? But he lived in between Stephen Hopkins and Howland's Field for close to 15 years, right, in Plymouth. Closest Wampanoag they would consider to be a friend. But there were people who didn't like them being here. We know that for a fact. There were walking out leaders who didn't like Pilgrim being here. We know one, one was Kompatan. He was the leader of the chief of Mattapoiset. He was totally against what Massoi was doing. You had Kanadakis, the leader of the Narragansetts, totally against what Massoi was doing. Massoi, I'm gonna touch on him real quick. He comes out, <clears throat> make that treaty in 1621 in March. He comes out for Harvest Festival known as Thanksgiving, he comes out to Plymouth in 1623 in August. We know he was invited to this, right? It was Governor Bradford's wedding. So Governor Bradford invites him. And Matthew, <laughs> you know how many people Matthew you brought this time? You brought six score of, people, of men. If you know what a score is, it's 20. <laughs> so you brought 120 men, four leaders, I will leave different communities 
and he brought one of his wives and his old, we think his oldest son won Sutter. And that was in 1633, 1623. Actually a guest of Bradford, one of the boys for some reason, I had no idea. And that's what I say, no, you're not getting my boy. But um, he's not mentioned again until 1639. He comes out with warm sutter son and reaffirms the treaty between the two people. So I don't know why, but there's a huge 16 year gap. Why I didn't write the interaction between Wampanoag and the colonists. <clears throat> now I'm gonna go into right here, praying towns. This is one of the first things that was placed on our people. Um, if we weren't Christians, basically what the church said, you can do whatever you want. And a lot of people either didn't understand our ways of doing things, our ceremonies, or did not want to understand our ways of doing our ceremonies. So you've seen, the, um, one of that is I'm not against anybody's religion. I'm just telling you facts. I respect all forms of religion, how people are as a person back then and today. Um, but we were played, we were, you know, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, but we were taught the King James Bible. We were taught Christianity. There's one source in, six, in the 1640s over the vineyard. One man, he's actually related to me. His name was Hyacombs. He learned the King James Bible so well that he was preaching it to English people, their own religion. <laughs> but not everybody liked that. There was a chief from um, Tropiquitic who called out Hyacombs and said, come here, what are you doing? You know we have our own ways of doing things and literally punched him in the face. It was a very confusing time, I can tell you that. We just lost a lot of people from plague. And I'm sure people think this might have been a sign for the creator for this happening. Unless you go back in time and walk a mile in their markets and ashes, you don't know what the people were thinking. What I can tell you, those up teens of praying towns formed, Natick being the first one in 1651, a lot of missionaries, you had the John Elliott, you got the Mayhews over the vineyard, you had the Cottonwoods, you had the Richard Bournes around my area. And this guy right here, he's, he worked closely with John Elliott and Natick, right? What John Elliott was thinking, this is how he comes to son, by the way, Joel. And Joel was sent to work with John Elliott. John Elliott learned Wampanoag. But he felt like the Wampanoag people weren't picking up the religion quick enough. So what he did, aside from learning, is he hired on Wampanoag interpreters and wrote the Bible of Wampanoag. And we have that in our position today. And that helped bring back our language. Think about Joel, right? He would have been the first graduate of Harvard University, native graduate in 1665. There was five supposed to graduate, graduate only one did Caleb. There were a few net monks who didn't. They went home, I think a couple died. Joel went home too, to, vin to the vineyard two weeks before graduation, right? He was considered to be valedictorian. On the way back, they stopped in Nantucket and he got killed. And it's unfortunate, it might've been his own people who killed him. It was a very tough time. There's a lot of traditionalists still on Nantucket living. Probably didn't like what he was doing. But what Harvard did back in 07 is they invited my family up there and they guess a posthumous degree in his name. So I have this in my office right here. Um, King Phillips War, the bloodiest war per capita in New England still today. Think about that war, you had the praying towns, right? They weren't considered to be English. They weren't considered to be full traditionalists anymore. They were caught in the middle. But by English eyes during the war, they were still considered to be Indians. And guess what? If you're a praying Indian, and although you're trying to stay neutral during the war, we're going to pull you on islands off of Massachusetts lit to die, basically. And these people brought Deer Island outside Boston, Clarks Island off of um, Plymouth, and a few others. And given no, no ways of living, no shelter, no food. Actually, there was one that's in the John Alley going out there on the boat, trying to bring them stuff, and they got, the boat got turned over. Um, King Flope swore, like I said, the bloody swore per capita happens. I'm not gonna go into the battles, I'm not gonna go into who won, back and forth each battle, we know who won, but um, there's a lot of bloodshed. A lot of people lost a lot of life on both sides. It starts in June of 1676, 1675, I should say, ends in around this area, August 12th of 1676. 
It ends with um, a native guide leading Captain Benjamin Church to King Philip. If you don't know who King Philip was, he was Massoit's second son. Okay, you had Warm Sutter, and you had his other son named Metacomet, who they called King Philip. Okay. Um, a lot of, lot of bloodshed, but when they find Metacomet, right, when King, um, Church finds him, he dismantles his body limb by limb, and he takes his head, brings it back to Plymouth, and puts it on a post of 20 years. But we do know that Metacomet had a wife and, and a son. They record this, right? They said, we can't kill them. That's not right. All we can do is sell them as slaves. That's what happened to a lot of people after the war. If the losers of the war, there's not a lot of positive stories that happened to the people. You had a lot of scalping and then servitude, slavery. The only thing I can think of is a, is a silver lining in a way. You got people down in Bermuda, right? Who are taken as slaves around here. And they still have their cultural identity. They still know who they are. Imagine that to slave all those years, they're still knowing who you are. So they come up to Mashpee Powell, their Powell, one year, July 4th weekend down Cape Cod, and one year we go visit them. That's pretty amazing. We go in the 1700s a little bit, right? 1742, the state of Massachusetts forms a law. If you're considered to be a remnant, that's what the terms that were used for us. If, if you're a remnant of a tribe in Massachusetts, you have to move to one of four locations. You gotta to move to Mashpee, where I'm from. You have to move to a quinter over the vineyard, or you have to move to Heron Pond, which is Manamet by the Cape Cod Canal, all Wampanoag territory, or you have to move to Grafton, which is Nipmo country. We know Wampanoag most likely never moved to Grafton because we knew that was a different nation, but the rest were dispersed down there. So. 1830 removal, removal Act. Yeah, Jackson, President Jackson formed this act. And you guys might have heard of the Trail of Tears, right? Let's remove people from the, the East Coast and move them west, a lot of times west of Mississippi. Not all, but a lot relocate away from their land. I bring this up because these people came to my area too, right? They came to my area and wanted, were ready to relocate us to Nashville, Wampanoag. There was one overseer of our community, non-native overseer. I want to say his name was Phineas Fish. And he told them, these agents, if you, if you remove the Wampanoag away from the Mashi Wampanoag away from their homeland, they're going to die. And the reason they're going to die is they rely on seafood on their, on their diet. So you go out west, there's no seafood. And they believe them. So that's why we're still left today in our homeland. And this is a a sign. <laughs> we have two signs coming into our, our community. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a township sign. Land of the Wampanoag, Incorporated, 1870. I, I put this up because it, it says incorporation. What that means is taken from me. And this happened the same time over a quinter over Martha Vineyard, Incorporated, 1870. What that meant for us as a people is, oh, guess what? Now we're a town. Now you can have so many acres of your land back but now you're gonna be taxed on your land. But for us, we're not a wealthy people. So a lot of our land got taken, lost, but we still have some. Whaling, very, very big for our people. 18th, 19th century, right? A lot of whaling going on. Um, we went, literally went whaling all around the world, period, all around the world. So some of us went voluntarily, a lot didn't go voluntarily. We have um, this great whaling exhibit at a Mashpee Wampanoag Museum put on by Ramona Peters, well-known elder um, historian, another um, man named Jason Mancini, who was the former director of the Pequot Museum. They put this exhibit on, and in, in detail, they named all these whaling ships, right? The names of them, the year they went out, where they went, and who they took from Wampanoag people and other indigenous nations. So I tracked my family, right? I found two of my family members. One went to the west side of South America and one went to the Pacific and they came back. A lot of people didn't come back. There was mutinies on these ships. A lot of people stayed in port. But if you did come back, you're considered to be well-to-do amongst your community. 
you know, a lot of our Wampanoag people and other indigenous nations captain their own whaling ships afterwards. So that was a very big industry. This is my wife again. So we'll touch on language really quick, right? Um, the language, right? We have our language back today. We have our language back today. We almost became that far from losing our language, right? That far. Back in the early 1900s, for a lot of cultures of people, you may make made fun of, ridiculed, if you weren't speaking English. This happened to a lot of cultures of people, right? So we either spoke inside the house, but gradually over the centuries, over the decades, we were losing it. There's one woman from our community, her name being Jessie Little Dobeard. You might have heard of her, heard of her. She won the Jean MacArthur Award, um, Jean's Award, and she brought her language back almost single handedly. How this was done, she was having dreams, right? During the 1990s. And so she said people were coming into her dreams speaking another language, and it wasn't English. She said the faces looked familiar to Mashby, but did not know their names. And one of her dreams, the people came and spoke English to her. They said, if the Wampanoag people had a chance to have their language back, would they say yes? So she took it upon herself, went to the community members and said, do we want to see Wampanoag spoken again? And of course, everybody said yes. So she went to MIT, graduated with a degree in linguistics, and started piecing the language back together again. How this was done. You had elders who could still speak some of the language, you had old documents starting now in the 1630s written in Wampanoag that Mass Bay different archives had that showed Wampanoag, right? The language. Um, you had similar language families. But what helped out the most, and I had no idea how she figured this out. She was like, she's a genius. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what helped, I, in my opinion, the most, what they'll say too, is, is when John Elliott was doing his missionary work, Native, he was um he wrote that Bible in Wampanoag, and we had one of those first editions in our language project, so that helped bring our language back fully, right? So now we have trained teachers who can speak fluently. My wife is a teacher. We have um, a Montessori school, which I think goes up to fourth grade now. The language is being taught in Mashpee High. It's considered to be a credited course, like French, English, Spanish is today. So that's, that's kind of cool. You, you, if you have your language, keep it, right? That's a big part of your cultural identity. This is our community and government center, right on the Wampanoag. In this building, I work actually in this building. I try to stay out as much as possible because I like it. <laughs> Got my computer, show me some Wi Fi, please. Yeah, um, this is where our leaders are at. Our leader, our, our chair, our vice chair, our treasurer council people, health department, education, human resources, elders, gymnasium, it's, you know. This is where a lot of decisions are made for our people. I'm gonna bring this up because this is kind of fresh in the news as of late, land and trust, right? We got challenged a few years back for our land, which is no more than 400 acres, by the way. Now, that's not big. We got challenged by a family who, got paid from large real large casino owners, which were ready to build one ourselves, and they didn't want that hap to happen. So they sued us and said, and our land got taken out of trust eventually. And we, we thought we were gonna lose at least. I thought so in others did, right? Our land fully. And we had some good people, um, just a lot of good historians, just being one. We trained our attorneys in the information they needed to know and went to court against the Department of Interior. Because what the Department of Interior stated was, if by 1934, if you're not under federal jurisdiction, you're not considered, you can't have land in trust. Keep that in mind, 1934, right? We got fairly recognized in 07. So, but when we went to court, we went against the Department of Interior and we brought up the Carlisle School. If you guys don't know what the Carlisle School is, that was one of the first boarding schools Native people after the Indian Wars were over. And that's located in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And the person who founded that boarding school, his famous slogan was, kill the Indian to save the man. 
And we know, this is the 1880s, by the way, from the 1880s to 1920s, Mashpee and Wampanoag people were taken to the, the school. They weren't allowed to speak the language. Their hair was cut. They had to wear different clothing. The culture was washed away. And by the way, this was on the federal jurisdiction in the 1880s. The federal government put this boarding school together. So fast forward to the judge, right? He asked, he asked the lawyer for the department of the Department of Interior, do you know what the Carlisle School is? And she would not answer that question. She knew what the Carlisle School was, but if she answered that question right there, the case would have been over. And the judge said, you know what? I know what you're trying to do. I'll come back in about a week or so and give you a decision. So he favored our side. We, we knew this. Um, so we have a land back trust today. This is our powwow, guys. July 4th weekend, come on down. Come see us. We have been on two or three years hiatus, right? All around the world. This year was unbelievable. We had so many guests from, we get over 10,000 guests normally a day at this three-day powwow. I, I remember pre-COVID, I don't remember these numbers we had this year. The, the dancers, the vendors, the crafters, a lot of good food, a lot of good crafts, a lot of good dances and songs. And we you know, asked the guests too to come and immerse yourself in the culture. So we invite you folks to get out there and dance through a little bit. Everybody here can do a two-step, right? So <laughs> come check us out July 4th weekend. And we do specials too, right? The recognized family is one who lost their family members. And this is all going to my brother. One floor, she got killed back in 97. His name being Melvin Coombs. And he was one of the best dancers in Mashpee, one of the best traditionalists. Um, his famous dance was the crow hop. And um, he loved the dance like the crow. And he is well known for that. So during this, we, we, we send out the Eastern War dancers out there and pick out the best dancer for this category. It's hard to choose, there's so many good ones, but this is one of them. The guy won this year, that's John Thomas, he's Narragansett. So, so we don't hate the Narragansett anymore. <laughs> <laughs> good friends of us, neighbor nation, so. So I wanna answer some questions what you guys have. No, you never stop learning, right? You never stop learning. We, um, Helen, did we ever sing that bibliography of our sources we have? Helen, Sorry. did we ever send you a bibliography of our sources? No, we didn't. I can, I can attach it, yeah. We have a lot of good sources, but one thing we do do, do is look at the primary sources. Like when, especially, we have a lot of stories go through our history, right? We lost, we lost a lot. I want you to remember that. Around this area, we got devastated around this area, different cultures and our ways of doing things we're encouraged to do. One thing that we lost, and it's, I hate to even say it, but it has to be said is we lost a lot of our songs, most of our songs, and our, a lot of our ceremonies from different laws that were formed, you know? I'll mention one right now that sticks to my mind because I did a study on this. November 4, 1646, if any Indian is caught powwow and are celebrating, celebrating their false gods or devils on English lands, they should be fined 20 pounds. So I didn't know what that meant, right? So I asked an English scholar, what does 20 pounds mean to an Englishman? The drives, that's a half year salary for an Englishman. Imagine what it meant for a native person back then. So what that meant is we couldn't do our songs. We couldn't do our ceremonies anymore. And a lot of our songs and dances were gifted to us by the Haudenosaunee up in New York, when it's known as New York in Canada today, you know? One good lining is today is we have our language back. My wife is a singer. Why my wife is a teacher of language and she's been producing songs in the language. So we look at sources, yeah. We look at primary sources of what it means. So that was the director of research up in Plymouth for a long time. And so my job was to look at these primary sources and jump into them and what they mean for a Wampanoag indigenous perspective and break that out, you know. Because what they wrote a lot of time was normal for them at times. 
I'll give you an example. One quick one is you heard me mention Matt, when Massoy came, he in 1623 to Governor Braff's wedding, he brought one of his wives. Because what they say, they say Massoy had five wives. We don't know that for sure, you know. What the English eyes are looking at, right, when they go inside of our houses, they're looking at people. And how English people lived back then is they have husband, wife, kids. How we live, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. husband, wife, aunts, kids, grandmothers, great grandma, parents, you know, grandparents, sisters. So they could be looking at sisters and aunts and consider them to be wives. So little things like that in detail that I look at and see what it means. Um, you guys want to learn more? There's a great book out right now on, on the King Philip's War. It's from a native perspective, which you don't hear a lot about. I mean, a lot of, of, of my non-native people, a lot of good non-native writers too, but her name is Lisa Brooks. Her, it's called A Beloved Kin. She's also written The Common Pot. This woman's amazing. Teaches at Harvard. She teaches at Amherst College now. Kim Booker, she's really hot. She said, <laughs> what did she say? She goes, I don't do speaking anymore. I'm kind of shy. I've seen you speak, Lisa. So I'm like, if you're watching, I've seen you speak. Yeah. She's simply amazing. Yeah. Yes. Um, what if you play your flute? Mm. <laughs> Once you're playing with food, what kind of foods do you guys eat? Oh, my wife is a really good cook too. She cooks a lot of different foods. Um, I like a lot of shellfish. I like a lot of um, cherry stones, little cohogs, steam them up. Uh, a lot of, you ever had duck before? Duck is, you gotta try duck. You can get duck in a market basket. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, duck and quail, you can get right in the market basket. So. Try it. You're going to want more. Uh, <laughs> deer. Deer is really good. I love deer. A uh, lot, lot of fish, vegetables, watermelon. Deer. Yeah, so we still, like, we have our hunters today and our, and our fishermen still today. We do a lot of that. And that's one thing that's always kept going. It's still there. Has not really been fully interrupted. So, but what's going on, too, is um, you got a lot of building going on. You know where I I tell you where I live on Cape Cod, and people are building, 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 and blocking off, whopping our pathways onto these waters, which they can't do. So a lot of time we have to fight this, you know. Why are you putting a fence up here? That's our way of getting out to the water. We're going to take a couple of questions for you. Um, there's a question. Could you, uh, it was one of the earlier pictures. Could you explain the facial markings on the girls near their eyes? And if, what is the meaning to that? Yeah, we, a dormant is nothing, it's extremely special for us. We do a lot of decorating. We do a lot of tattooing, permanent tattooing. We do a lot of facial paints and body paints. Don't think just this facial paint as being one. We, it's the whole body done up. It's done for different reasons, you know. Um, little kids wouldn't really have much on. You see a lot of men, women wore it a lot, like how makeup we wore today, but yet some will, what meant a lot more than others. We know we still do today. We're black for mourning somebody's past or such, you know. Um, yeah, Domi is very big. Tattooing, earrings, necklaces, our clothing. If you look at our clothing, when we saw people, the folks had a lot of painting, right? And we had paints made from different ochres, minerals from the ground, charcoal, you mix with hide glue. And what hide glue is, if you get like a deer skin, you scrape that membrane off the deer skin you boil it up and it forms into a glue. And you mix with the ochre or the charcoal, that's how you get different colors. You paint that onto the skin. And how you make the skin really soft, and you see myself when we're on leggings, deer skin leggings, how you make the skin soft is you take the brain of the animal. Each brain has enough protein and enzymes to break down the skin to make it soft. So you rub that right into the skin. If you don't do that, you're gonna have ride. You don't know where I had sometimes you feed these dogs or little chewies. So that's how you make this. So, yep. Yeah. What are some of your recommendations? Sorry. What are some of your recommendations when 
kids come home from school and they learn these stories about the English coming over and the colonists and all of those are told in, um, you know, very much from a colonist perspective. I mean, it's hero stories that the kids are hearing and then they, yeah, and then there's the chapter about how the Native Americans met the colonists and then that yeah. is it. And so as a parent, I'm always looking for ways to say, let's learn a little bit more, let's dig a little bit deeper. Um, and so I just didn't know if you had any other any thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, just try to get I guess many indigenous speakers listen to these on, on YouTube, maybe. But it's um, yeah, I get a lot of these stories, and a lot of us favor to one side. And there's not a lot of salt there to do what we do. But um, one thing to remember is we're we're a culture of people, like any culture of people. Um, we have our ways of doing things. We laugh, we sing, we cry. You know. And um, we're human beings, you know, we've gone through a whole lot. And for us to be here still today, it's, it's simply amazing, you know. And where I used to be employed is we we talked about a lot of issues like this, right? You had the village, Pilgrim Village, which is a plan of character in 1627. Then you had the Wampanoag home site, right? And where we were in third person on purpose. We wanted to be in present day because we, we didn't want us to be stuck in one year. Because we want to span the centuries on what's going on today and why, what, why things happened, why they did, you know, and tell the truth. And that's one thing you could keep on digging for the truth of what history is. A lot of it's not pretty, as you might have heard, but it's how you, you present the history, right? And not everybody can do that. I'll be honest with you. I come from a strong Wampanoag community, and there's still a lot of hurt because slavery is real. And, Cultural genocide is real, and you know, colonization is definitely real. That all encompasses it, right? So when we interpreted this at the museum, I looked at is we dealt with thousands and thousands of people a day, and I would have folks come up at the little store, country store, dry scan where I work, where you work, and I'll mention all the factors what we talked about, and they look at me and they'll laugh. I said, no, I can't do that because it's hard. It's real. We just we didn't come in to the museum. And turn on at nine o'clock, we're whopping on people and shut off at five. We were the people all the time. So, um, yeah, it's you look at these books, a lot of it's written by its favor to one side, and but people want to know the truth today, you know, they want to know what really happened. And the best way I can say educate people is I know you don't blame, you don't take it on, on the folks who you know, you're speaking to, it's not their fault for what's happened. But if I'm speaking, it, I'm speaking. I want people to realize to take that in, and because of the facts, I just put out the facts. A lot of these facts, like I said, when you mentioned traders, fishermen, you have to put in slavers because that was normal back then to say that to do that. But you say that in a way that, hey, you know, it was your folks who did took slavery first time seen around here, 1637, down the Pequots. You know, they were the slaves after that massacre. If I say it in angrily form, people are gonna walk away. I was in Hawaii a couple of years at a conference, NISA, the American Digital Studies Association. And part of my talk was heavy shoulders because where I worked at, at that time, we dealt with a lot of people, right? And there weren't many places around people can get educated in indigenous culture, Wampanoag culture. It was Wampanoag culture too, right? But who, if you're traveling, right? If you're a guest, how are you gonna come into that place and how are you gonna leave? It's how you gotta think about a lot of indigenous people, period. So my heavy shoulders, they took on a lot of responsibility, me being the director, they knew that. Because I must say, I didn't, never told them, hey, you know what? I want you to say, let's talk about corn, beans, and squash, and sing a song. That's one thing I would never do. No, we're not gonna do that. You're gonna hear, the, like I said, part of the series we have going on, you're gonna hear the stories, our history first, before you're gonna get the crafters and the, uh, the office coming up here and the singers and dancers. So, so we got to give you guys a base. So, hopefully, you learned something right today. You learned something. <laughs> we can take another question. <laughs> tribe and a nation. I don't know. We, we, don't, we don't use a tribe a whole bit. I guess some people do. I, I like using the word nation myself. It's like, what's, 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 
what's the difference between indigenous and native, you know? Indigenous is, in my opinion, the people of the land, the originals. And native, you can just be born here to be native, you know? You know, the one thing I'm gonna to to tell about stereotypes, you know, is terms that have been stuck on our peoples. Native American, you look at Native American. That term's not even, that's not correct. We were here you know, long before this place was ever called America, right? You get the term Indians. You know, that wasn't correct. You got Columbus coming over thinking he landed in India. So because give the terms Indians are stuck. How, if you know anything about yourself as an indigenous person, you got to go by what community, what nation you are. You ask me, I'll match you up on. If I go to different, if I hear different people say, well, I'm Native American, I'm going to, that both of them red flag to me. Now, what, what are you? Native American, what does that mean? And there's a lot of things that's gone through on us over the centuries that maybe that culture has been washed away. That person is from a nation. He just, or she does, just doesn't know. It. But if you know you're Native American somewhere, you should, you, genealogy, track it down. New Hampshire, Vermont, up there area. That's Abenaki. Abenaki versus Wampanoag. Yeah, I think they also speak the Algonquin language as part of the family, but they're far north. And that you look at the, the King Phillips War, that war went on later, much later, up north, around this area, kind of fizzled, 1676, but went on a little longer. There's over 500 nations, though. Indigenous states have gone across the United States. I can tell you what, how what's common amongst our people is how we think about life. We respect all forms of life, being tree life, animal life, plant life. I'm going to use a famous saying, not a saying, but this woman, she's one of my teachers, Linda Coombs, right? What life meant to her when she saw this. She was driving up the highway and she saw trees being taken down, clear cutted, and she felt a severe pain in her chest. Because what she was witnessing and what she felt was that life being taken away. So you have that, oh, you have that connection. Like where you sit, where you stand, is not, you don't own that as part of who you are as a, as a people. You live in harmony with Mother Earth and the Creator. So you're not there to own your, this is mine, this is yours. We all, we all got to live together as one, you know, and take care of Mother Earth as best as we can. There's been a lot of damage done over the years. Um, there was someone that asked, were healers in the tribe also raised spiritually for this role from a young age, and how were they chosen? This is from a question. That's, that's very similar for our people, yeah. Yeah, you hear a lot of medicine people, like, um, you hear a lot about medicine men for, for a while, but people, you have a lot of medicine women, you have both. And you, we have a medicine man, Nashby, name, his name being Guy. Yeah, he married my wife and I back in 04, but we have a lot of spiritual leaders too, our clan mothers, and, and there's certain leaders, people know who they are, just because they don't have a title doesn't mean nothing. People know who to go to for certain things. Yeah, and, but yeah, you can see little ones with that special quality in them. From then on, yeah, that could diversity be raised like that. Uh, I was curious um, if there was any symbolism with the colors that you're wearing. It's our four colors, four directions. So, this is my unfinished ribbon shirt. shirt. <laughs> I go let's match my um my ribbon, so let's put it. I'll put it on. So, but the ribbons. It, this is a contemporary wear. The ribbon shirt itself, but you gotta see more ribbons on it. Maybe next time I come up. So, as you mentioned earlier um, about the land issues and four hundred acres and the land trust. What's happening to the land? Have you been able to get some of the land back um, in the Nashville area? Yeah, yeah, we have, we have a conservatory. Um, um, we have some tribal people who formed their own nonprofit. Ramona Peters is part of this. And, and she's a highly, highly respected, and others, um, Leslie Jonas and such, highly, highly respected people in the community. And they formed this nonprofit. And 